Global Business Insights podcast from PS Learning, featuring your hosts, Dr. Charlotte de Brabant and Max Kent, bringing you the leading global experts and thought leaders from all industry sectors to give you cutting edge key insights into the future of business, technology, and thought leadership. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the next episode of the Global Insights podcast with my very good friend, Amanda, who, well, we go way back sharing a lot of thought leadership, sitting on the ISM Thought Leadership Council together and and many other advisory boards. I'm so thrilled Amanda got uh, took time off a busy schedule to talk a little bit more about the future of procurement and what that beholds. And uh, I'll, I'm joined with my with my uh, partner in crime, Max. Hi, Max. Nice to have you back. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Amanda. Really, really pleased to have you on the podcast. Really looking forward to it. As, as you uh, know, we'll find out procurement is a real um, close to my heart subject. So really looking forward to hearing all your um, insight into that. And, and Amanda, just to kick things off, maybe you would like to just introduce yourself and, and a little bit more about what is it that keeps you so busy? <laughs> Absolutely, Charlotte. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here today to both you, Charlotte and Max. Really always get jazzed about talking about the future of procurement and and where we're going as a profession. So just a little bit about me. I was a practitioner for 16 years of working in procurement at uh, large CPG companies like Kraft Foods or now Kraft Heinz. Um, Conagra, Kellogg's, and I also had the opportunity to move into the hospitality world as my last stop in uh, the corporate world at MGM Resorts International as the vice president of procurement. And um, what I did in those roles was not sourcing necessarily, it was large scale change. So for instance, if we were deploying SAP, which we did three times across those companies. Um, I was leading that effort on behalf of procurement, or if we were opening a new property, or if we were um, doing a merger and acquisition, in sourcing or outsourcing, I was the one leading those initiatives and making sure that we were getting the maximum ROI from that initiative, but we were also having a positive impact on the business. So uh, in all of that experience, I really fell in love with how people and cultures and process and data and technologies all come together to really make true change within procurement organizations. So four years ago, just over four years ago, I decided to leave the corporate world and start my own consulting firm, which is called Wonder Services. And Wonder Services was really born out of this idea that Technologies in general are becoming more simplified. They're becoming more easier to configure, um, easier to implement. However, what still remains a huge challenge within procurement and really across all professions is the user adoption and change management around that implementation. And so we saw, I saw some opportunity where procurement was getting quite a bit of dollars and in investment coming our way more than usual over the the past uh, several years. However, we were still seeing kind of mediocre results on the true return on investment. So, and, and study after study was pointing to lack of user adoption, both internally within your four walls and then also with your supply base. So instead of just sitting there noticing this and trying to do a better job for the, the um, organizations that I was working for, I decided with my skill set that we could build a wonderful uh, boutique consulting firm helping as many procurement professionals be successful in these initiatives. So that's what we've been doing over the last four years. We've been having a blast, have the opportunity to meet so many wonderful procurement professionals and beyond. We're we're actually starting to move beyond just procurement within our scope of what we do at Wonder, but a lot of procurement projects still, and it, it's just fantastic to see what a the professionals in this um, that have been faced with all of these um, new requirements over the last several years, and how we're strategically moving through those and solving for those additional needs. So I'm excited to talk a little bit more about that today, Charlotte. 
Thanks, Amanda. That's absolutely brilliant. And again, as I said at the start, it's a subject really close to my heart. I've got um, and have had my own procurement consultancy for a long time now and um, really enjoy working, particularly in the education sector, to uh, really help uh, make a difference, actually. And you really can with procurement. And um, also one of the things I found exciting working in, um, again, the small, smaller boutique consultancy with very bespoke client projects, um, is you get to kind of shape the future really and, and at least talk to them about new trends and things that they're probably seeing and, and having to be told to look at. Um, how do you anticipate those kind of trends, particularly in, in the future of procurement, perhaps new new technology, new tools, that kind of thing coming in? How do you think that will impact um, your role in the industry in general? Oh, I, I, I think about this a lot, Max, and um, I actually... Um, one of my good friends, Anders from Focal Point, he was he was talking. Uh, we were chatting the other day, and he he mentioned something that really resonated with me. And he he said that um, you know when we started, or I'll, I'll speak for myself, when I started 20 years ago in procurement, um, it was about saving the company money, and then um, it, it evolved to saving the company from risk. Um, whatever risks that that might be present in in the um, ecosystem of our third party supply chain, um, financial risk, geopolitical risk, et cetera. And now we're asking to say be be part of saving the world. Um, and I thought that was so eloquently put that you know when when we think about the scope and scale of what procurement has been challenged with, it it's really, been very dynamic over the last several years, um, growing rapidly, and and at the same time, we're not we're not getting a lot of extra headcount. So I I really see this dynamic where procurement's value proposition is continuing to expand. It's becoming more and more a critical part of an organization's success and ability to gain market share and um, reduce risk. But at the same time, we're being asked to do that with the same headcount, some same structures in, in the organization. So I see that intersection happening and um, a real serious look at technology happening now because we need to solve for that dynamic. Um, so, so I see that on the horizon and I see AI playing a lot in that space. Um, in fact, I. Um, was just having a conversation yesterday about this, about how um, the the new AI technologies that are coming out and how that's going to dramatically change the landscape of procurement technologies that are available right now um, and how we can potentially reimagine um, the complete end to end process with these new AI technologies. Um, so it's it's going to be really dynamic, Max, in, in the coming years. I think that couple of layers going on, increased value proposition, increased responsibility, stagnant growth maybe in, in resource availability. So a, a turn to technology and AI is going to be, I think, very prominent. Thank you so much, Amanda. And maybe just as a follow-up question, how do you think the increasing use of technology in procurement will actually change the way companies approach procurement and what specific technologies do you think will actually have the greatest impact at the end of the day? Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to play on Charlotte. This is a really good question. I'm going to play on this AI a little bit here. And I know it's a buzz. It's very buzzy right now, right? There's a lot of conversation going on about AI, but I do believe um, it's going to be able to dramatically change how we approach procurement. So um, when I was first in procurement, the big thing was uh, systems like Ariba, where we were taking a very paper driven process and putting it into the digital world. Um, and honestly, that's still where a lot of the focus is is today. Right. So you still see a lot of um, procurement professionals who are challenged with the technology deployments, thinking of that that core P2P process or the the source through pay process and trying to get them into some sort of tool set moving away from kind of a paper or manual process into a, a digital one. However, I think in with this influx of AI capability, if you can imagine a scenario where a a user can describe what they want in a in in, in an AI based system. And then 
fully without having to go into any other system, that transaction can take place behind the scenes through um, different AI connections uh, throughout your landscape. So it, I, I think that the way that this could potentially be going is that it's going to uh, allow that user experience to be much more simplified, where it's a, basically a form that they're that they're asking to buy something, um, or e uh, um, even I don't know. It can extend into inventory. Like I need something out of inventory. Do we have this in inventory? Do we not? And and then basically behind the scenes, the transaction takes place. So, so I really see like this, and this is going to come together, I think, relatively quickly. Um, now, I will say, uh, to play devil's advocate with myself, I like to to bring up this this fact that we have uh, still in the industry today. Um, earlier, I actually think it was late last year, I was reading an article that said that you know, with all of the effort that we've put in place to digitize something as easy as a invoice. Globally, we are still only at about 30% electronic invoicing. So why, where I say AI is going to move very quickly, I think the technology is going to come along very quickly to enable um, a, a, a pretty dramatic change in how we approach our day-to-day um, -day business within procurement. However, it's only going to move as quickly as people adopt it, right? So the technology might be available, but it's still up to the leaders within procurement, the leaders over the source through pay process to fully adopt those technologies. And that will dictate how quickly it actually gets embedded into the procurement landscape. So um, just leading on from that then, I think that's a really, really good answer because it's it really is the case, isn't it? Absolutely, it's, it's the same as of what we've heard on previous podcasts, what we're seeing in the industry, certainly what I've felt out in the market when I've been working in consultancies and working for software businesses that's been selling this kind of technology in um, via procurement and finance. I think there's always a bit of a, a gap in understanding between the finance and the procurement teams as to what uh, what they can actually budget for, what what they want to implement, and um, yeah, when we when we look at the larger enterprise businesses, they tend to lead the way. So when you mention systems like Ariba and and some of those larger systems out there, then that's how um, that's how those systems really adopt perhaps more um, more advanced technologies and take it forward, um, and then others follow sweet, sweet and you get end up with the sort of best in class solutions um, evolving. I really think AI, as you say, will, will play a part in where the data comes from and how we scan um, pieces of invoicing, pieces of purchase orders, all of those sort yeah. of data entry points. Um, all of those things lead towards a much more digital kind of role, though. So how do you see the role um, of a procurement person evolving over the coming years, um, mm. really, for the sort of professionals out there? Yeah, so um, I still hear, Max, a lot of uh, professionals talking about firefighting within procurement, um, even with all of the advances that we made. And I think that's partly because of the dynamics that have been happening in the um, world around us over the last several years. But um, I do see the role of procurement changing quite a bit where there's um, going to be less focus on the day-to-day -day transactional operations. I think most of that will be um, digitized, automated, um, simplified along the way with the help of the technologies that we were just referencing. Um, which means that the the role of procurement, I think, is going to be much more focused, even more so today than today, on um, those strategic relationships and really being a trusted advisor, where we're going to have more data at our fingertips to be to need to decipher. We're going to have to understand how to build those strategic relationships with our suppliers so that we are their preferred customers, so we we don't experience as many. Um, uh, supply shortages as may maybe our c competitors do. Um, we're going to need to be much more strategic with our stakeholders to, to keep up with the pace of business um, as things continue to accelerate as technology evolves even further. That's only going to accelerate the pace of business. So I really think that much more of our focus is going to be on relationship building and, and how do you go about doing that effective 
influencing skills, questioning skills, um, being able to really seek to understand what the other person is trying to drive to and being able to to strategically think and problem solve around um, how to help them be successful. And that goes both internally and with our supply base. So I really see that that's where it's going to evolve to from a core skill set. I do also believe that there are going to be many more people focused on technology and technology enablement within procurement than maybe there are today. I do see more roles coming out like um, head of procurement technology type things, but I see that becoming more of a core part because as um, I think the pace of this uh, AI component of what's coming into play is going to be very fast and it's going to evolve very quickly. Um, and so you need to have either trusted ad um, advisors through consultants who can keep you in the loop on that pace or hire internally to help um, uh, your organization stay abreast of all of those very rapid changes in the marketplace so that you can take advantage of the capability that's available to you. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing. And next, I would like to expand a little bit more on the topic which is uh, centered uh, around my passions as well. As, yeah. as you know, I've worked at Johnson & Johnson in the whole field of supplier diversity, equity and inclusion, supply sustainability. That was very much my, my sweet spot. And maybe you can just elaborate a little bit more what role do you think diversity, equity and inclusion will actually play in, in the future of procurement and how companies can actually ensure that procurement practices like these are being embedded and included, especially considering that we are always faced with lower and lower budgets. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So uh, there are a couple of a couple of things that I um, are playing through my mind on this one, Charlotte. First of all, I think um, as procurement's role is expanding, this is one area that obviously is a very much part of that expansion. And I think it, it's there's going to be um, more of a focus on this for organizations across the globe as more and more regulations and government entities are requiring it. So I think there's a part of this that is very much driven by those requirements across the board. Uh, not that we should be waiting for those requirements to happen. I think there's a, a large play with diversity, equity, and inclusion within procurement to be successful at driving what um, what the business outcomes need to be within an organization. So I'll give you an example. Um, I always like I always like to relate things to other um, other things that people might uh, relate to. So I, I'm sure most people have been to a symphony before. People enjoy a symphony because of the diversity and the inclusion of all of the different um, different types of instruments that are played within a symphony. You wouldn't want to necessarily go to a symphony and just hear the flute player all day long. So there's there's beauty in that diversity as people are looking at how do we creatively solve problems? How do we understand our customers more effectively? How do we learn from each other in the different perspectives that we have? How do we make sure that we're bringing in those different perspectives so we can be creative and problem solve and move quickly? It's it's really a requirement of organizations to do that, right? Um, we cannot live in a world anymore where it's we only have flute players because we will lose in an organization. You will not be able to remain competitive in the business marketplace if you don't have a, a diverse perspective especially with everything coming at us each and every day from geopolitical risks to wars that are going on to um, supply chain uh, shortages to inflation. I mean, you need to have a very robust, diverse team to be able to navigate um, the, the world that we live in today and be successful. So that that's very much what, what grounds me in the importance of this. Um, but we we do uh, it, it's going to remain a core to any organization, including procurement. And for for procurement to be successful, they need to be thinking about how do I diversify and include um, every diverse perspective into my organization. But then also, Charlotte, 
um, we're doing the same with our supply base because I think that is a huge untapped opportunity for procurement to understand that your suppliers bring a very deep expertise in, into the equation that I think we're just scratching the surface on um, day in and day out. We we might be doing that very well with our um, more embedded strategic suppliers, but there's there's a whole untapped um, part of our um, ecosystem that I, I think if we were able to understand the diverse perspectives, the diverse backgrounds, the diverse ethnicities, um, more effectively, we can gain so many more insights and innovation from our suppliers if we truly have that um, diverse landscape in our supply base and that we take the time to do so. I, I love that, Amanda, and I'm really, uh, truly 100% with you there. I think you're absolutely right that, you know, it's not not just that having a more diverse um, workforce or more, di more diverse um, staff or supply chain is a nice to have. It's a, it's a must have. You have to look at it that way and people have to, businesses have to um, look at how they how they include every single different um type and um and really move forward with that otherwise they will be left behind and i think that's the sea change that we've all needed which is which is fantastic um moving slightly forward on to how that could translate into the partnership between supplier and procurement which i think you touched on as well and i'm um, really, really keen on that subject as well. I've spent my career working both in procurement and on the other side of the fence as in business development and sales. Um, and really the whole reason for me doing that was to understand both sides of a transactional process, if you like. So um, if you if you think about that and that whole premise that really we need those strategic partnerships between su supplier and procurement to, to help us in the future, um, is that one of the steps you think people could build for more resilient supply chains in the face of the future disruptions? I mean, hopefully it's not going to, it's the last pandemic, but I think it would be sensible to future proof against natural disasters and future pandemics surely in the future, wouldn't it? Yeah, and, and uh, we we know full well that the the more prepared we are, even even in the hopes that it never happens again, we're going to be better off. In the in the meantime, so and I, I Max, I was actually just up at a um, an event up in Utah recently, and um, I was asked the question, "How do we ensure that we don't have supply shortages from our suppliers?" And my first answer, my first part of that answer was, well, "I don't think you can ensure anything, right?" Um, however, you can mitigate your risks by, um, and it's it's probably not what what people think of first off, but I think the, the largest mitigation for supply chain disruption reduction is to have more effective relationships with your suppliers. Um, and the, 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 thing, the thing that I always go back to is, and, and Max, you mentioned you've been on both sides of this, and, and I, I've now over the last four years have been on both sides of it too, but the, each of your suppliers are looking at you as um, as a customer and they're ranking and stacking their customer base on who's most profitable, who's easier to interact with, where do they think that they can drive innovation and have a really great relationship. And those, those relationships are getting actually ranked as their A customers. Um, and then your B customers might be easy to interact with, but maybe you're not making as much margin. And then it goes down from there. <clears throat> so procurement and suppliers have traditionally, and I think we're kind of moving away from that for the most part right now, but I still, still think there's pockets of this, whereas where procurement and suppliers were like arch enemies, right? So we go in, we try as procurement professionals to drive down um, any margin that that supplier is making so we can drive cost savings and we could care less about the impact to the business and, and how, how well, I shouldn't say we care less. I'm, I'm over dramatic there. But, <laughs> um, but you know, it, there's there was that very strong drive to reduce margin and to to gain savings for the company, which totally understand where that is coming from. However, we do have to realize that there's more than just cost in a relationship that we need to be very aware of. And yes. with the dynamics of um, the, the world that we live in right now, agility is going to be crucially important to anyone to succeed. So if you have robust relationships and you know an understanding of, 
of the cost savings versus margin of what that company could bring to the table, and you're investing in the relationship, the the customer is going to be much more um, willing to invest back. So what does that mean? A customers usually don't get put on ration for supply. They they do, they have strategic conversations in advance of um, issues occurring so they're aware that they might be rationing certain items or you know or put on some sort of schedule so so that relationship becomes critically important to be able to um, have that agility that you need to be successful in an organization so i'm going to give an example to kind of bring this home max so one of my um one of my good friends he's a cpo and um he uh, worked, um, he works in, um, jewelry business. Okay. So they buy a lot of diamonds. They, it's a very, very interesting business to be in. And so, um, in advance of when all of the supply chain shortages were happening, my friend kind of started having this feeling around, Hey, you know, things, the economy's not really, um, you know, as we come out of COVID there, a lot of things could happen. There's a lot of dynamics coming into play. He was a little bit nervous about how things would play out um, on the supply chain side. Um, They had very robust relationships with their core suppliers and their core suppliers were starting to have conversations back with them about how to plan for that outcome. And they took different positions. They they, um, made different buying decisions to protect and and, um, make sure that they had inventory for um, the upcoming holiday season. And so what happened as a result of that uh, relationship that occurred, they were able to um, not have stockouts for their customers during a very critical holiday season. Uh, well, their competitors had um, struggled with having availability of um, the stock for their customers. So they actually increased their market share um, and help sustain a very competitive position in, in for um, their overall company because of the decisions that they were able to make because of that robust supplier relationship. Thank you so much for sharing, Amanda. Um, and now going more into, into this whole data-driven decision-making, um, how do you think procurement will will need to adapt to support the growing importance of of data-driven decision-making in businesses, especially looking at master data. I know we are in in my current role, the current company having just drastic problems when it comes to data and and that whole element. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and I don't know if I should say this on here, but sometimes when I think of data and, and all the improvements we can make in data, I, sometimes it's this feeling of we're just getting crap faster. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say stuff like that, but um, but that's that's, that's, <laughs> that's the general that's the general feeling um, sometimes because I think there's there's going to be uh, a lot more technology and even some of our current technologies are coming out with new functions to. Um, take the data and actually convert that into insights, okay? But with that said, your insights are only going to be as good as what your data is as the input. Um, So if you're having foundational data issues, and if you want to get to the point where you're actually getting insights from your data, you have to look at what are some of those root causes to be able to uh, cleanse your data and be more effective in that space. I will say though, like um, I've been asked by customers before, how will I know when my data is clean? Um, and I, 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 th- I don't think that journey is ever um, ending. Like you can put governance in place to help per- to shield some of the, the bad data coming into your um, organization. However, there's still going to be a need for a constant review of, of your data to make sure that it's, um, you know, uh, mostly clean, if not more clean than it is today. So uh, building that kind of uh, foundation is going to be really important for any organization to do at this moment, because um, if you don't do that, you're either not going to be able to use some of these new technologies that are driving data into insights, 
or you're you're going to deploy a system like that and get really cruddy insights at, as an outcome. So um, so that that's my general thought process there is that um, you there is going to be a growing importance to be able to move as quickly as we're going to be asked to move. We're going to need to have your data become insights. Um, and so that you can quickly action those insights within an organization. But if if you don't have that that base layer of master data correct, it's going to be really, really hard to get there. Thanks, Amanda. That's um, really interesting how I think data has a huge role and totally agree with you to play in procurement in the future. Um, and once again, coming back to the conversation of those supplier collaborations and partnerships, that's also something that suppliers can really help with, I think, and can really um, help organisations have better data. And if there's that partnership in place, they can really share those key insights and help drive savings. I mean, certainly any real proactive um, business development relationship I've been in with a procurement has really been about showing how you can save them money, resource, time, you, know, you name it. And that's the sort of things that you need to be um, on on hand to to really do. Otherwise, someone else will, will be in there stealing your business effectively. So yeah. um, really, really music to my ears about how you, you start to talk about customer segmentation and how um, business development and sales teams rank their customers. It's the first time I think I've heard that kind of language from procurement and, you know, with all due respect, because it's nice to hear how people are starting to learn that. I think that there could be all sorts of, of training between the two departments. If you look at, you know, sales, internal sales, internal business development teams working closely with internal procurement teams, perhaps on training courses mm -hmm. to share their own experiences could be a good way forward. Um, yeah, absolutely. How, how do you see sort of taking all that in mind? How do you see um, that collaboration um, between um, procurement and suppliers and maybe those other stakeholders as well achieving the goals in the future? Yeah, um, Max, it, I'm, it's interesting. I was just reflecting back on when I learned about customer segmentation and it was actually um, at my last, um, during my last SAP deployment. Right. So it was an end to end supply chain conversation. And we had people from the order to cash team involved in the design sessions because we were truly thinking end to end. And they started talking about customer segmentation. And I was like, well, of course, I mean, we we segment our suppliers to strategic, transactional, tactical, whatever. We can't imagine like it, it's silly to think that our customers are not doing that with us. Like it's it's a natural way to prioritize, and it's um, very important and how how decisions are made within the organization. So that's actually where I learned was from our own internal order to cash team as they were talking about customer segmentation. So, um, but going back to the question, um, I some something that has come up quite a quite often lately with um customers has been this whole conversation about uh where do i start from a sourcing standpoint um and um i had a customer approach me and he's like we we went through all this data we're building a sourcing pipeline and um but through questioning i i found out that it was really done in a silo um, because I was I was asking, well, what what is the importance of of these initiatives or these sourcing categories to the business, and how is that going to drive business forward for the organization? So when I think about kind of the evolution of procurement, I'm thinking I, I think that there needs to be much clearer alignment with the key stakeholders of an organization to understand what they're driving to what they're trying to achieve, what what gaps or problems they're trying to solve, and really, really going into those conversations as a procurement professional to seek to understand what they're being challenged with, and then coming back with some solutions for them to help them achieve their strategies. Because that's, in, in, in all reality, I mean, the business is moving so quickly, we need to make sure that we're in lockstep to ensure that we're providing that strategic value where the business is going. So 
I would like to see a little bit more of that collaboration um, within pro procurement and their stakeholders to truly understand what's driving them forward, to understand what in innovations they're, well, I, you know, innovations is actually pretty tight when you're coming out with product in in innovations, but outside of that, what are those other things that the business is trying to pull forward and achieve in the, in the coming months and how procurement can strategically help them do that? We have a lot more tools in our tool set um, where we can go in and we can talk about um, not only how do we strategically ne negotiate or work with a supplier or um, even think about how our process is designed or how we can be more efficient as an organization. So it's much broader than just going in and saying, I'm going to do an RFP in this category. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing. And I think just to elaborate, I mean, now more than ever, especially looking at this collaboration, absolutely, as you said, communicating the, the standards, the expectations, but really going into this open communication with the stakeholders and and really having this open dialogue to build trust and uh, and not being afraid to, to actually ask questions and, and make, at the end of the day, that the suppliers are our experts. So, yeah. so there it's really important to, to leverage from from the knowledge and and not any longer in procurement we have this good guy bad guy scenario anymore um if it's just dialogues or if it's negotiations but it's actually mm -hmm. having open communication where each party stands i think that's yeah. something that especially we've learned just over the last few years where this partnership is so so crucial um Absolutely. just last last question for for this uh podcast how do you think the increasing importance of transparency and accountability will impact procurement practices and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more what steps can companies actually take to ensure that their procurement processes are transparent and accountable oh, this is a big one this is a big question to, an to answer right? yeah save the best to the last <laughs> <laughs> okay so um so there's there's a couple of ways to think about this so when I think about transparency and accountability, the first thing that I think of is digital, right? If, if you are going to have a truly transparent and accountable uh, supply chain or procurement practices in general, um, to be able to have that transparency and that accountability, you, you really need to have a digital process um, where you can have the data, the insights, um, and measure and track and have metrics around it. Um, so that you can use that and have that transparency internally, but then also have that transparency externally to um, the various government entities that are now asking for that type of insight or other organizations, your customers who might be asking for it too. So um, I think there's uh, that with that increasing importance of transparency and accountability will also be an increased importance of moving away from manual processes where you still have them into the digital world and then being able to report on them effectively. There are still some very large gaps in this though. So I think of some of the requirements coming out um, related to um, uh, different types of labor in your supply chains. I still think there's a ways to go to be able to get are um, to get effective insights around what's going on, not only within our direct suppliers, but our supplier suppliers. And I, I think that's really where we have the largest gap is in those examples where we have maybe good insights at times. I'm not even gonna say we have great insights today around what our supply base looks like. However, the expectation I think in the transparency is if we're doing business with uh, that supplier that we also have an understanding of how that supplier is getting their work done on our behalf. Um, and I, I really think there's a, a large gap there that still needs to be filled to be able to drive that transparency and accountability all the way um, as, as we used to say it in, um, in the CPG world from farm to fork, right? So trying to understand what all those handoffs look like and, and get our arms around it. So if you're not, if if you are working in a, in a procurement organization today and you're trying to drive forward transparency and accountability because it is coming, it's going to be required. Like if it's not already in your area, it, it's going to be. 
So I think this needs to be a large part of the conversation and where you're looking to invest in um, digital capability and trying to close as many of those gaps as possible that you have into that end-to-end -end supply chain of our supply base. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, I, again, I love your um, holistic strategic approach to looking at how procurement um, really can change. And I think think you're really on to how things need to change in the future, actually. And um, it's been really, really interesting hearing your approach on everything today. And um, yeah, I'm absolutely right with you, 100%. Um, if anyone wants to find out more about your work or they want to get in touch with you, could you just share for, for our listeners um, your details one more time? Obviously, we'll put that in the description, but if there's any yeah. parting thoughts you'd like to share, please, please do. Okay, so um, I am a big fan of using LinkedIn. So if we're not connected on LinkedIn, please look me up, Amanda Prochaska. Um, and the one thing that I, I stand for on, on that platform is that um, I'm not going to be dropping you a bunch of dms trying to sell to you <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh the point of linkedin for us is to drive uh, thought leadership and um and insights for procurement professionals so if you have are not following me yet on linkedin please do so um, outside of that they can uh, find more information about wonder services at wonderservices.net um, and we also publish blogs out there every month so you can see more insights through our resources page on the Wonder Services website. So we do encourage you to check that out. And um, and then you can always email me. I'm uh, at amanda.prochaska at wonderservices.net. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing. And especially also thank you for our listeners for joining in once again. It was such a pleasure to have you, Amanda, in this podcast. Thank you for your time, for all your thought leadership and see you all next time yes thank you very much amanda thanks for your time we'd love to have you back on again and just discuss more about how the, the world has turned uh, in the future one more time perfect i thank you so much for inviting me again this was a pleasure i always love uh, uh chatting about procurement and where we're going as a profession Global Business Insights Podcast from PS Learning.